This is Smart Bear Academy, and you are attending Collaborator 101 with the technical engineer, John Fortunati. I wanted to let everyone know about an event that we have coming up this fall. It's called Smart Bear Connect. This is our second annual user conference. It's being hosted at the Boston Marriott Copley Place. And right now we are actually accepting speaker submissions. And so what this is, it's a two-day user conference. So we bring together every customer from all or, or as many as we can from all around the world to meet um, with each other to be able to talk to other customers. We have trainings, we have uh, panels, guest speakers, industry experts, et cetera. So we do have early bird pricing going on now until June 15th. And to learn more about what it was like last year, or if you're trying to figure out if you want to attend this year, feel free to go to smartbear.com backslash connect 2018. And for today's Smart Bear Academy, um, there's myself, Mary Catherine Sullivan. I'm an enterprise customer success manager here at Smart Bear. And we also have John Fortunati, who is our technical engineer for Collaborator. So he will be walking you through today's Smart Bear 101 Academy. And to kick things off, just wanted to give everyone a little bit of insight into Smart Bear, just in case if you weren't really sure who we were. Um, we've been the leader in software quality tools for teams for just about 10 years now. So we were founded in, tw in 2009. Uh, we have over 6.5 million users across all Smart Bear products. We're in 194 countries, and we have roughly over 22,000 companies using our products. We are headquartered in Boston. That's where John and I are right now with seven offices globally. We have our EMEA headquarters in Galway, Ireland, an office in Stockholm, Sweden, Coconut Creek, Florida, and Memphis, Tennessee. We are the open source innovator, so if you've ever heard of the tools Swagger and Soap UI, then that is Smart Bear. But as for today, we're gonna to be talking about collaborators. So just to give everyone a quick overview of the Smart Bear portfolio, as you can see, we have a number of products that fit between the UI and the API level. Today, we're gonna to be talking about collaborator for code and document review, but just in case you weren't sure, we have testing products for uh, UI functional tests. Uh, you can also do cross-browser testing, uh, web load tests and monitoring your web and API performances. And then we have a number of API tools. So in case you're into designing, developing, or documenting APIs, we have a tool called Swagger Hub. And then you can also test these APIs with our, our tool called Soap UI Pro. So with that, I will stop boring you and I'm gonna pass this on to John so he can walk us through the agenda for today's um, Collaborator 101. Good morning, everybody. This is John. Uh, my turn to start boring you. Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> All right. So what are we going to cover today? Um, the 101 is designed to be not just to look at Collaborator. We will look at Collaborator, but also a discussion around peer review in general. So first we'll start off talking about some of the benefits of code review. Why do we want to do code review in the first place, whether we're doing it with Collaborator or without? I hope you are with, but if not, just doing code review in general, why is that a good idea? Next section, we'll be talking about best practices of code review. What are the things that you can do, take away from here, that will improve your code review process? Again, with or without Collaborator, these takeaways will help you make a, help improve your code review process. And then finally, we'll look at Collaborator. I'll highlight some of the things as we go through the tool. We'll quickly move through the tool and I'll highlight some of the things that we talked about in the first two sections and how they're reflected within the actual product that uh, Collaborator. Sounds good. And just as a uh, reminder for everyone, if you have questions throughout the session, um, feel free to put them into the Q&A box and we'll be answering them throughout the session as well as at the very, very end. Does that sound fair? Cool. All right, John, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can take control and we can kick things off. Cool. So I'm going to share my screen. Now, I don't really have much to show for those first two, first two, um, first two sections. So what I'm going to do is just put up the collaborator workflow and get that from the right slide. There we go. Um, we're just going to talk these, through these kind of verbally. So that first section, what are the actual um, benefits of code review? Why do we want to do code review? A common thing I have heard when I was working with dev teams on the dev side of things is I don't want to do code review because it's going to take too much time. It's going to uh, slow down the development process. I, don't, I need to get this stuff out the door. I don't have time to sit down and have someone wait for someone to read my code. However, that in my opinion is a misconception. There are a lot of benefits that you can take away from code review that in the long run 
yes, today may take me a little bit extra time to get that code out the door, but will benefit my overall product quality and overall dev team quality in the long run. So I think well worth the investment. Um, but what are those three benefits? And the three key benefits that I would like for everyone to take away from the session today is the first is finding bugs earlier. The second is building cross functionality. And the third is traceability. And that one's particularly important if you're in a regulated industry or any industry that has a compliance standards that they need to meet. So let's talk about that first one, finding bugs earlier. Um, if you look at the process of finding a bug, there's a few places in the dev cycle where you can find a defect. The, the worst place to find a defect would be live in the field. That's when a customer finds a defect and says, this is ruining production, this is halting my production, I can't function as a business until this defect is fixed. That's the absolute worst time to find something. It's extremely expensive um, from a customer relations point of view, but also from a fixing the defect point of view at that point when the defect is live in the wild, there's a really good chance that it's been a few weeks to a few months since that developer has actually worked on the code that generated that defect in the first place. And there's a very good chance that they don't remember exactly what they were doing. Um, and will take a decent amount of time to actually get back up to speed and find a solution for the defect. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with finding defects in the QA cycle. Cheaper in the sense of your customers aren't finding the defects, but again, you still have that time lag between when the developer was writing the code and when the defect was actually identified. That leaves the last one that I'm building up to, which is finding the defect during the development when developers are actually writing the code. And that's really what peer review is trying to enable. Um, a peer review is much like when you're in high school and you have to write a paper for your English class and someone has to do a quick review of what, what you wrote as part of the assignment, um, they're gonna find spelling errors, grammar errors that you wouldn't have found yourself because your mind was so focused on actually writing the paper that you wouldn't be able to go in and see those things. Um, just like that with development, working with code review, people on your team who aren't as familiar with the code that you're writing, who still understand it, but not necessarily will be working on it, will be able to help you find those defects that you yourself couldn't see. I um, mean, again, that's gonna save you money in the long run because it's gonna make fixing those defects much, much quicker because your, your head is thinking about the code that you're writing right there and then, so it'll be easier to fix those. And then also in terms of cost for reputation, um, impact against customer base, that will be avoided as well as, as much as possible by finding those defects earlier. So the second thing is cross-functionality. And what I mean by cross-functionality is the ability for your dev team to have workable knowledge of the code base that you're responsible for. Um, another term for this is the bus test, which we've talked about a number of times in some different, different webinars that we've done. The idea of the bus test is what would happen if you had one of your team members, um, unfortunately out of work for a few weeks because they were hit by a bus. In that case, um, would your team be able to pick up the slack for that dev team member? Would they be able to work on the features on the part of the code that that dev team member was able to work on? The idea of building cross functionality is to make it so that, as we call it, bus number is reduced. So more people are able to pick up that slack. And a great way to do that is with code review. Code review obviously pulls people from different parts of the team together to look at something that they may not be as familiar with. And through that, they learn about different parts of the code base. Sure, they may not be able to pick up the code and start developing right away, but at the very least, they're familiar with it. They understand at a high level how that part of the code works. What are some of the key things that they have to remember? And they're more likely to be able to pick it up in the future if they need to. And the third thing is traceability. Again, very important for regulated industries. A lot of times, if you have to prove compliance with some kind of design standard, you need to show a traceability between the feature that you described in a requirements document, the work item that would encapsulate that feature, the code changes that are reflected in that feature, and then the review process around that feature. A lot of times, the review process is flat out required in some of these documents. So having the ability to have that traceability and say, yes, I, want, I wanted to meet this requirement. I have this change in my code that's supposed to meet this requirement. And here's someone who verified that that change does what I expect it to do and doesn't introduce any security vulnerabilities or defects within the system. And so again, the three benefits of code review, finding bugs earlier, cross-functionality, and traceability. I'll pause there because it looked like we had a question that came in. We did. We actually had two. Cool. Um, they're more product-related questions, but do we want to go ahead and just answer them? 
Sure. Yeah, let's hear them. Okay. So someone says, I participated in a collaborative code review recently and entered some comments into the chat area. I'd like to delete them before others can read it, and I can't seem to find a way. Uh, so this is actually, I will answer this now because it goes into the traceability conversation. So Collaborator is used by a lot of developers in the regulated spaces. For example, Defense Industry is a great example of that. And uh, they have requirements where they can't delete things from reviews. So Collaborator doesn't actually have a way of deleting comments from reviews for that reason. Now going forward, we're toying with the idea of putting in a draft ability so you can draft comments before you actually make them public so you can remove those kind of comments but to, to meet that requirement for those regulated industries where they have to maintain that traceability we can't allow deleting of comments so you can hide comments um, there's a little x next to the comment and i'll show you that when we pull up the tool that you can click and that'll strike through the comment it'll gray it out so it's harder to see but unfortunately we can't delete it awesome and then this one might be i'm gonna say we might have to set up a demo with this person mm -hmm. but it says can you point me um, at how a how to trigger a collaborator review when a TFS Git pull request is triggered. I'm thinking that might be something that we have to do in a separate demo. Yep, let's we'll talk about that in a separate demo. Okay, awesome. So what I'll do is I'll reach out to the person who asked that question, uh, connect you with either myself or your customer success manager, and we'll set up something separate. Maybe like half hour, we can figure out the best option for that. Yep, definitely. Cool. All right, definitely. I'll let you continue. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I should point out um, a lot of times these one-on-one -on -one sessions are targeted for people who maybe just joined a team and they're not as familiar with collaborator or the process, so which is why I go through this, some of the stuff. But um, again, feel free to ask questions about the product specifically while I'm going through these, why code review? What are the best practices for code review? That kind of stuff. Um, those are all fair game. All right. So the next section is we talked about the benefits. Now, what are some of the best practices of code review? And, before I go into best practices, let me explain how we actually determined what's the best practice and what's not a best practice. So a while ago when Collaborator was an emerging code review tool, we teamed up with a large software developer. Um, I think they were rolling out upwards of 2000 users on a code review process. They had no formal code review process up to that point and they wanted to use code review again to get those benefits that we just talked about. But as a part of that, they also wanted to see, does code review actually get those benefits and, and what about our code review process could be improved? So when we have teams in the future, 10 years down the line, we can share that information with those teams and kind of have an internal you know, standard to meet. So we worked with them and we did kind of an A-B testing where some teams performed code reviews in some ways, other teams performed code reviews in different ways. And we compiled the data, looked at it, and then from that data determined what are some of the best practices that will make your code review the most effective. And by most effective, I mean, if you're going to take an hour to do a code review, how can you get the most out of that hour? So you're not wasting your time or you're not, um, you know, so you're maximizing the value that you get out of that one hour. So from here, we have four key takeaways. The first is checklists. The second is author annotating. The third is 60 to 90 minute code reviews or shorter duration. And the fourth is smaller reviews. So I'll go through each one of those in a little bit more detail. So checklists. Checklists are how we ensure completeness of a code review. Through the study, we found that teams that use checklists to go through and keep a list of things that they should look for, whether that's dependent on the language of the code that they're looking at or the code base that they're looking at, helped team members not only remember what to look for, but also move faster through the code review because there wasn't that guesswork of what should I look for next, even though maybe they knew what to look for, that'll help them move through faster. In addition, it also provides that traceability. So you can go back and see, all right, who did this part? And that eases communication a little bit, which makes the overall process a little bit faster because then you can easily pinpoint the person you should reach out to if you have a question about who verified this particular part of my JavaScript file. All right, the second one is author annotating. And this one was something that we had an unexpected result with. So what the idea of author annotating is before I start my code review, I, as the author, go through and pre-comment on the code, on my changes, what I was thinking and why I made those changes. Now, the reason that it's counterintuitive that author annotating actually helped code review is because one of the risks that we anticipated was that when you have the author go through and say, hey, this is what I was thinking about for these changes, the reviewers are very likely to see that and say, ah, oh, that makes total sense. They'll be too close to the code 
and they won't be able to provide a critique on the actual code. They won't be able to be a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Objective, objective observer. However, we found just the diff found just the opposite. Reviewers were still able to be objective while looking at the code, even if the author pre-annotated the code. However, when the author did pre-annotate the code, it allowed those reviewers to get to their state of mind quicker. So they were able to say, ah, okay, so this is what Bob was thinking. Oh, Bob is wrong, but they didn't have to spend time trying to figure out what Bob was thinking. They, they already knew what Bob was thinking, so they could get there a little bit faster. So they were still able to be objective and still be able to provide a valuable review. However, they were able to get from A to B a little bit faster. The third one is shorter reviews. So I'm sure as a lot of us are aware, if a class in college goes over 60 or 90 minutes, we start to zone out very quickly. If anything goes over 60 to 90 minutes, aside from maybe like a Michael Bay movie, we start to um, lose attention. And I'll make that a point not to go over 60, 90 minutes today. But that same thing applies to code review sessions. So they found that teams who spent roughly 60 minutes got a lot of value of code reviews that lasted until about 90 minutes. And then from the 90 minute mark on, they got diminishing returns on the time that they were spending on the code review. So the idea here is keep them short. If you're going to perform a code review, don't spend a ton of time doing it. Block off an hour in your calendar and just take that hour to really look at it. But then after that, you know, give yourself a break, take a break and don't, don't force yourself to keep looking at it because realistically the amount of value that you'll get from that is going to be um, less impactful than the time you were getting before. All right. And our final one, I do see some questions are coming in. So we'll address those after this final one is smaller reviews. So kind of in line with spending less time on reviews, we found that teams that kept reviews smaller were able to have um, more valuable reviews. And by the way, when I'm, when I'm talking about valuable reviews, what I, what I mean is uh, let's say I make a code change and there's inherently 10 10 defects or 10 things that I could find wrong with that code file. A, a high value code review process would find eight or nine of those things on average, right? A low value code review process would find four or five of those things, which would mean the other six or five would get into QA and then maybe potentially even into production. So that's what we mean when we talk about a high value code review. It's, it's finding all those things that are already there, whether we did a code review or not, those, those issues would still be there. But just like with shorter reviews, doing smaller reviews allows people to focus on the code, allows people to understand the code and keep all of the changes in their head so they can actually connect everything and make logical conclusions that lead them to finding some of the defects that they're looking for. Um, so again, typically we found that around 200 lines of code, at least per session, you know, maybe if you have a larger code review, spend an hour looking at a chunk of 200 then move on to a different chunk of 200 for a different hour after a break, of course. And that'll help you get more, more value out of your code review. Find more of those defects or things that need to change that were pre-existing and already there in the first place. All right, so again, those four items for best practices. If you, if you leave right now, you can at least take these away with you. Use checklists, use author annotating. It'll only take about 60 to 90 minutes per session and keep the reviews small, around 200 lines. So I will pause there because I know we got some questions coming in. I'm going to take a sip of water while MK reads off some of those questions. Sure. So not, necessar not necessarily questions, but people were wondering if, their, if the connection had dropped because they were just staring at the collaborator workflow. Oh. So what I was thinking was, and this is something, thank you for guys pointing this out, is actually we should actually create a couple of slides for some of these best practices. So I will make note to create something like that for the next uh, 101, um, or we can look forward to the other collaborator um, classes like the 201 and 301 to see what else we can do to sort of um, help illustrate some of these best practices and whatnot. So no, so everyone, we are still staying on the collaborator workflow. Um, I'm not sure if you heard John mention it, but in the beginning he said he didn't have a lot to show for the two main, uh, the two first parts of today's session. But as soon as we get into the tool, obviously you'll start to see what collaborator looks like if you haven't already. But moving forward, we will take this piece of advice to create a couple of slides for this, just so that we don't have anyone worrying that they lost connection. But you're all in good hands, don't worry about that. But another question came through um, asking about smaller reviews. So you had said shorter time 
you know, the 60 to 90 minutes, but what do you actually mean by smaller review? Is it less chunks of code that you have to review? What does that it, look it, like? It means when the reviewer sits down and actually performs their review of the code to immensely to themselves say, I'm only going to do this for an hour. And then also, even if the code review has a bunch of files on it, maybe just pick one file or a group of files that go together and say, I'm just going to focus on these files. So it really means chunking the code review. Now, the code review itself, in terms of if we're looking at a collaborator code review where you could have as you know, many files as you want, um, from that perspective, it means just as a reviewer saying, you know what, today I'm going to spend an hour just looking at these subset of files for about an hour. And then tomorrow I'll look at these different files or maybe the morning, these files, the afternoon, these files. Um, does that answer the question? Does that make sense? Sure. I guess we'll wait and see, but I'll let you continue. Those are the only ones that kind of came through. So thank you everyone for the suggestion on um, the slides for the best practices. It's something that I will take into consideration after. So cool. <laughs> appreciate the feedback already. This is great. All right. So if there are no other questions, I think we can move into collaborator and do a quick, just quick walkthrough again. Um, the one-on-ones aimed at maybe people who haven't seen Collaborator before, joined a team for the first time, and part of that team is using Collaborator as a code review tool. Excuse me. My mouth is a little dry this morning. All right, so I'm going to close this. Well, I guess we've had this slide up on the screen for the past 20 minutes. Probably should explain it. Um, so this is the overall or basic Collaborator workflow, and we can break the Collaborator workflow up into four key phases. The first is going to be getting your code into Collaborator. So how do I create a code review and make sure that the changes I want to review are actually in the tool? The second is how do I pick a custom workflow? If I'm working on different teams, team A may have a different workflow than team B. They may have different requirements, maybe a more stringent or strict code review process that they need to abide by. And how do we make sure that team A can abide by that process and team B by a different process that's maybe less strict? Next, we'll look at performing the review. So how do we actually work with a code review in Collaborator? We'll look at that from the reviewer's perspective and the author's perspective. And then we'll look at how we close out reviews. And then after that, we can look at all the stuff that goes around the Collaborator workflow, like reporting, as well as things like integrations, third-party interoperability, um, doc review, you know, whatever else, whatever questions anybody else may have. So does that make sense? Anybody have any questions at this point before I start pulling? tool up. One question did come through. Are there any best practices with workflows that can help with secure code reviews? Um, this person says they do use checklists. So cool. is there anything else that you could offer? Off the top of my head, I know one of the biggest things for secure workflows is ensuring that people can't get access to reviews that they shouldn't have access to. So in the administration section, you can choose the type of review access that people will have. For example, you can set it as anyone, which would mean that anybody who has access to Collaborator on your network can have access to any review that's on that, um, on that server. Excuse me. Or you could really restrict the access by saying group-based and users. And that would mean that you would have to not only be in the group as the person who created the code review, I'm sorry, in the same group as the code review. So you associate the code review with a group, but you also have to be a participant on that code review. So only that very, very, very small subset of people are allowed to see that code review. Um, in addition to that, I do know that participant profiles are used often in enforcing kind of more secure reviews in the sense of requiring more reviewers or requiring a moderator or restricting who's allowed to call something fixed, restricting who's allowed to actually pr uh, move the review or promote the review to the next phase. Um, that's another, another avenue for enforcing security on a code review that, that I've seen. Um, but if you would like to talk more, hopefully that answers the question first of all. Um, and if it doesn't, we could definitely set up a time afterwards where you could kind of evaluate your use case and then from there probably make more uh, specialized recommendations or a recommendation that would fit your use case more appropriately. Yeah, they said that secure meaning uh, cybersecurity code review. So I understand. So um, off the top of my head, I don't have anything specific for cybersecurity code reviews um, other than, you know, making sure you're pulling in the people from the right. If, if your organization has a security team, and this is something I have seen, uh, which is why I use it as an example in my demos. 
uh, making sure you're pulling in the right people from the security team to perform that code review on any code that is sensitive. So I guess having a mechanism to flag code that needs a security review, I've seen that typically done in JIRA. And then making sure that that particular person or, or team is pulled into the code review process. Now you can do that with things like subscriptions and review pools that'll make it easier to pull those people in. And those are two concepts from Collaborator. Um, and that'll, that'll help make sure that you have the right people associated with that review. Does that help at all? I guess we'll find out, but that's a, that, that'll actually be a good use case to hopefully talk um, to this person about if needed. Sounds yep. very cool. Yeah, at the very least we, should, we can do a um, 30 minute call and talk about that in more detail. All right, any other questions? You are good to go. All right. So let's walk through Collaborator. So I'm going to drag my Chrome browser up here. All right. So again, Collaborator is a code review tool that's what we're talking about. And how do we actually use this tool? What, what does it look like to perform a code review through Collaborator? Um, so I'm just going to walk through those each one of those four phases pretty quickly. Um, so let's look at that first phase, which is creating the code review and getting our code into Collaborator. So now I'm going to do this through GitHub. And actually, I should point out, you guys are getting a sneak peek at 11.3. So right now, 11.2 is the only is the you know, latest release that's available. But later next week, we'll be coming out with 11.3. Um, I think it looks a little nicer, which is why I installed it in my demo environment. And uh, you guys will be able to play with it next week when it's officially released. We'll also be having a session on what's new in 11.3, where we'll pinpoint specific new capabilities in 11.3. I probably won't talk about much, much about that today. All right, but I'm in GitHub and what I want to do, let's pretend I'm a developer. I want to make some changes in my repository and then I want to get that reviewed by Collaborator. How do I do that? So let's make some changes to this file and look at the process, look at how pull requests can help us create code reviews. Now, if you're using something like SVN, this may look a little, a little unfamiliar if you haven't used GitHub before. Um, but basically what I'm doing is I'm making a change to my file in GitHub in real life. I'd be doing that on my local machine and then pushing it to my repo. But in this case, for demo purposes, I'm just going to make the change here. And I'm going to create a branch for my pull request. And again, if you're using SVN, this may be a little um, unfamiliar and I can show you what that would look like using our client GUI right after I do this. But for those of us who are using Git, I'm creating my pull request, and when I do that, Collaborator is going to automatically create my review for me. So without any work on my end, I have my review created, or any work outside of what I normally do. I have my review created, and we can also see down here that the way I have my repo configured, if um, compliance and security is a concern, I have Collaborator set as a precondition check for my merge. So now I can't merge my pull request until Collaborator has... Uh, identifies the review is completed to GitHub. And then from there, all I have to do is go into my review, maybe choose a template if I want to. In this case, I don't want to. Add myself as an author, add someone as a reviewer, and send that review off to inspection. So that's, that's the basic process of completing a review. And again, we can see that GitHub does most of the work, creates the pull request for us, creates the review for us, and all we have to do is select a template if we need to, add a few people on the review, and then click that big inspection button in the top right-hand corner. So now let me show everyone what that looks like if we're using the client GUI. Now, Collaborator is a server client model. That means that we have a server that's living on our network somewhere. And that server has a web interface, which is what we're looking at right now. But we also have a thin client that can live on your desktop machine or your know, local machine. And that thin client's going to be used entirely for getting code into Collaborator. So in this case, you can see I have a number of different integrations to different version control systems. So if we have anybody on the phone that's using Subversion, TFS, um, PTC, Perforce, this is how you, you would integrate with those version control systems to get your code into Collaborator. Um, the reason I show the GitHub workflow is because it is becoming more and more popular um, but this is also still a very popular workflow. So from here, just like from GitHub, instead of creating a pull request, I'm going to have my changes on my local machine. And I'm just going to add those changes to review. Give my review a title. So maybe one or two more clicks. 
compared to GitHub, although not much more. And then just like, just like before, choose a template if I want to. So we can see those checklists. Uh, but in this case, I'll keep the default template, add our participants, add myself as an author, add a reviewer, and then send that review to inspection. And that's going to start the review. So same exact process, except instigated or started off with the client GUI on your local machine instead of a GitHub pull request. So I'll pause there because I think I saw some questions come in. Um, do you have any questions? Yes, we have one. Uh, someone asked, how did, how did GitHub know to create a collaborator review when the pull request was created? That's done through a webhook. So from the collaborator side, you tell collaborator that this is my repo and here's the credentials to get access to my repo. And then what collaborator is going to do is reach out to the repo through the GitHub API, build a webhook in GitHub for you. And then from that point forward, every time a pull request is created in GitHub or you push to a specific branch that's monitored by that repo, GitHub will send a packet to collaborator and say, hey, make a review for me. And here's the information you need. So GitHub is giving Collaborator all the information it needs. And uh, the value of that is you know that the code that you're looking at is the exact, exact copy of the changes that you made. So you don't have to worry about accidentally pulling in the wrong file or um, grabbing an older revision from the version control system because you know that the version control system is actually giving you the information and verifying that these are the changes that you requested within that pull request to be reviewed. Does that make sense to answer your question? So then we had another question come through. Uh, someone said, our company has a fixed number of licenses. If I have the client application enabled, does that mean that I'm using up a license? Nope. The client will never use a license. Uh, just like the command line interface, most of the commands through the command line interface will not utilize a license. Um, there are some certain commands through the CLI that will, but in general, the only time you consume a license is when you're connecting through the web UI or something like a TFS, um, sorry, a Visual Studio plugin or the Eclipse plugin and actually looking at like an interface. And again, just to reiterate that the uh, command line client, I'm sorry, the GUI client will not use license. Cool. All right, any other questions? Not yet, so you are good to go. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna close out this review and go back to my GitHub review. Now, I'm just gonna go through how I started this review a little bit more slowly. Because when I, when I first came into Collaborator, I selected my template, I added some participants, and I clicked start, but I didn't really talk about why I did any of that stuff or how to actually do that or you know, what's the value of doing that. So let's, let's go through that a little bit more slowly. So the, when you first start the Collaborator review, if you have custom workflows, if you have different teams, again, like we were talking about before, one team maybe has a more strict code review process than another team. How do you enforce those? And those are going to be done in those three things that I kind of skimmed over really quickly, which are groups, templates, and our participants down here. Excuse me. So let's talk about each one in detail and talk about groups first. So why groups? What are groups for? So let's say um, I have team A and team B. Team A can't see the code for team B. Or I have a situation where I want to get all the defects that I found in my project and look at them in a view that I found during the code review process. Or let's say, like we were talking about earlier, I want to make it easy to add participants to a review. All those use cases are going to be satisfied for groups. So when I associate a group with my review, I'm going to apply that security, verifying that team A can't see the review for team B, assuming that you have those admin settings that we talked about configured. In addition, I'm going to make it easier to do reporting. I can filter, show me all the defects for team one from project five. I can do that using groups. And then likewise, if I want to add that security team, I can just add their group to my review. And as soon as someone volunteers from that security team, they'll be added to the review and the rest of the team will be dropped. Again, making sure it's easy to get the right people onto my review um, for the type of code review that I'm doing. The second thing is the template. And again, I picked this pretty quickly. But templates are the real driver of those custom workflows. So let me change to Code Review Basic over here. Now, when I change to Code Review Basic, you'll notice a few things happen. I'll edit this again. Uh, the first is the appearance of these custom fields. 
The second is this checklist down here, which I know I said some, I know you said some of you are using. And the third is our rules around participants, which you can't really see, but in the background, those have changed. The custom fields are going to help us grab data as part of our code review process, especially important if we're part of or doing code reviews to meet a compliance standard. Again, this will help us make sure we grab that data and then can later report on it. Checklists are going to help us ensure that completeness. It's also one of the best practices from our code review that we talked about. And participants are going to apply those different permissions about who's allowed to do what with the code review, how many reviewers are required, who's allowed to fix a defect, who's allowed to move the review to the next phase. So that's going to really either restrict your process, make it a more strict process, or make it a more relaxed process. And all these are going to work together to do that custom workflow. I'm going to switch this back to default because it's a little bit easier to work with. All right. And again, that last one is participants. So when I went through this the first time, I quickly add myself as an author, and then I used my recent participants area to add my friend Dev Lead Colin as a reviewer. So now if I want to add people to the review, this is where I'm going to do it. And again, this is going to help me make sure that I'm adding the right people to the review. The default, basic default template, when you first install Collaborator, has a concept of three different roles. You can configure up to four different roles for a role profile. Again, the default roles are author, reviewer, and observer, and there's three of them. Um, author being the person who creates the code review or the GitHub pull request in this case. Reviewer, the person who's required to perform a code review. And the observer being someone who is optional for the code review. Now this plays into that cross functionality. A great practice here is to add people to your team as observers. So they're still getting notified throughout the code review. They can still come in, they can still ask questions, participate, log defects if they want to, but they're not required to actually click that send to completed button. So you're not waiting for them. They're there if they want to be, but they don't have to be. So it's, it's a great way to build cross functionality and pull in the rest of your team. Um, in this case, again, I'm just going to add Colin back to my review. Over here, one thing we can point out is if we go back to that application of groups of making sure we have the right people added to the review, here we can see that we have those review pools or those groups which are able to be added as reviewers. So I could add that security review team to my review. I could add it as an observer. And now I have someone or hopefully someone will volunteer from the security review team and help me out with my code review. All right. So again, those three things we covered as part of that second phase, choosing a custom workflow. Our groups, templates, including the custom fields, those checklists, and adding participants. Before we move on, I had a couple questions come through. Um, someone was wondering, is there a way to show different checklists for different code review states? So this is, for example, um, you have one checklist for items relating to a standard code review while you have another checklist that has items for a cybersecurity code review. Is that possible? That is possible through the templates. So what you can do is change your template to change your checklist, if that makes sense. So you could have a template A that has you know, three custom fields and checklist A, and then you could have template B with the same three custom fields, but with checklist B. So you just have to choose the template you want to drive that selection of um, checklist. Does that make sense or does that answer the question? They said changing templates clears out custom fields. Uh, that is true. And that is a big limitation that we will change. Um, unfortunately, right now that that is the way that stands. But we're making a lot of changes to checklists um, in the upcoming releases. It's one of the top priority items on our roadmap. In addition to UI changes, support for Git and some other source control management systems. Um, so that will come eventually, but unfortunately, that is a limitation right now. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Um, someone had asked, we're developing an application. If someone, uh, puts, uh, if someone has to put some of the files for the, for the review and I'm the reviewer, um, I want to add his code and run the application and check, check whether the functionality is working or not. Is there any way to actually do that? So you want to get the code changes he made from Collaborator and use that to rebuild your application locally and then test some changes. Is that correct? Uh, 
I'll, I'll go forward assuming that that's what you're looking to do and correct, correct me if, if not, but um, you can grab the files from the diff viewer. If you go into the diff viewer and forgive me, I haven't played around with the new UI a little bit too much. There it goes, there's a download button. So you can download um, the diffs and then you can apply those diffs to your own local files to get the changes that they've made or you can just download the files directly from the materials section over here. Here it is. So I can download those files directly. And let me drag that over so everybody else can see. So now I have my main.java file and then I could compile and build that application locally. And I'm, I'm assuming this is a simple setup. If you had things like um, containers and all that kind of stuff, you know, that I'd probably get more advanced and change and you could probably set this up with your build system. Um, Cause again, we have a command line interface, which is fully featured and pretty, pretty flexible. So you could probably automate a lot of that and uh, wrap that into your build system based on code reviews and stuff like that. And, you know, have your Jenkins pipeline call collaborator and say, Hey, give me all the files in this review so I can rebuild it. All right. Any other questions? You are good. All right. So now that our review is in the inspection state, uh, we can go look at that next probably most interesting chunk of the code review process, which is actually performing a code review. And we're gonna do that from two vantage points, one from the reviewer and one from the observer. So I'll pull open our reviewer's session in Firefox over here, we're logged in as Colin. And we can see my review down here is review 540. Just a quick note on this. Um, again, this is the 11.3. UI, so we've made some UI changes. The action items menu is still relatively the same where we have all of our action items here, the progress of the review, who created the review, what my role is for that review, due date if we have one. Um, a little change that I will highlight here is now we have our recent reviews up here, so we can easily look at all the reviews I've looked at previously, and I can easily click my review button to go with the last review that I've looked at. All right, but as a reviewer, there are two things that we want to do. The first is going to leave general feedback, and the second is going to leave required feedback. Now, both types of, all types of feedback, both required and just general, can be tied to either a line within the file or to the overall file in general. Filling it out to the overall file is as simple as going to this overall box. So if I wanted to leave a comment on the file and say, hey, this, this whole file is, needs to be changed or something like that or shouldn't be included, um, we can do that here. Or if I wanted to leave a comment on a specific line, I can just select the line and we'll tie those conversations to the line. Now this will play into that third benefit of collaborator or using code review in general, which is traceability. So having that information about knowing which changes were in my file and who reviewed those changes, this will allow you to maintain that, that thread. So over here, I could say something like line level comment. Now, this is also how the author would do the author annotating. If we go back to the best practices, um, I would be able to go in here as an author, even though it's in the inspection phase, it doesn't really matter what phase I do this in. I could just go through and start annotating this as an author if I wanted to. So I don't really have a best practice in terms of when to do that. I'm just doing it in general before you send it out to your reviewers. But if I wanted to log a defect or require a change, I can do the same thing, tying that change to the individual line, but instead of, I can't type and talk at the same time, instead of adding that as a regular conversation, I can add that as a defect. And when I do that, these custom fields will pop up. And why is that important? Because if I wanna later report on those defects, if I wanna find trends in my defects, am I finding defects in a certain part of the code, I can do that using these custom fields. And these are driven by those templates that we selected when we started the review. And these are completely customizable, so you can add more fields here, change the content of those two default fields, you know, do, whatever you, uh, do whatever you need to do to get the information that you need. So with that, our reviewer is happy. They have left their feedback, and we can send this to the rework state. Now, one thing I didn't point out is in the background, all those notifications that we expect to happen are going on. Just a note on those notifications, they are customizable. So maybe be something to look at for your specific installation if you want to customize what your notifications look like, you can do that in the admin section. So I'll pause there. Any questions on performing your review? 
Yes, but this one relates to document review. So sure. someone was saying that they're planning on also using Collaborator to perform document reviews um, and was wondering if, A, you had time to possibly show an example today. If not, mm -hmm. um, would that be something that they can get a separate demo of just so they can see how to basically, you know, do that. But essentially, it's the same thing as doing a code review. It's just obviously the different files, correct? Exactly. Cool. Um, and the answer to both is yes. So I'll show you really quick right now what a doc review looks like. And then we will also show you, or we can set up a separate call to talk about doc review um, in more detail. Um, I'd, be, I'd be also interested to know your use case for doc review, because that's something personally I'm trying to build, you know, in my head, more knowledge about what, what are the different use cases for doc review. Um, but this is an example of what a doc review looks like. So just like that code file, we're showing the diffs between the two versions of the same file, highlighting what's changed or been removed. Um, allowing you to leave feedback at specific points of the file. In this case, since we don't really have a concept of line numbers like we do in a code file, we're leaving our feedback tied to specific locations. So I can click anywhere in the document. I know you really can't see that because of the blue, but we can see over here in the far left, starting conversation at page three dash pin and then the coordinate location for that pin. So that's how we're tying our conversations to specific changes within the document. But otherwise, the same exact process, you can have a code review with both files and documents, as you can see here, just documents or just files. Awesome. Then one other question did come through. Um, someone was asking, is it possible to view the code differences? I'd like to see the changes highlighted. The changes highlighted. Uh, maybe you could give me a little bit more information as to what specific changes you're looking to see. Um, that are that are different. The diff viewer is going to show us all the changes that have taken place in the file. I can look at, I can change my display changes up here. And again, this is an 11.3. So if you're using 11.2 or earlier, you won't have this. Um, but I can look at the last accepted changes, the last commit. There's nothing to, I only have one file here. So I'm not, this is a bad example of what to show here. But I can use these display changes to change around what specific comparisons I'm looking at. And I can also stack it if I wanted to see a stacked view. And I don't know if that hits kind of any, hits the spirit of the question. Um, he said, yes, it does. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, so let's quickly look at the author and what their responsibilities are to a code review. So I'll go back to my session as the author in Chrome, and the author is gonna to wanna to do two things. One, digest the feedback from the reviewers, and then two, upload a new revision of the code. So to digest that feedback, let's go back to that demo review number 92. Looks like it's not my recently reviewed reviews. Because this is a bit of a better example of, you know, a review with a lot of files on it. So to digest that feedback, the author is going to want to easily see what's changed and understand um, what conversations are happening around the different files. And we can do that from the material section. So if we look at the material section, we'll see all the files that have been added to the review. We will see which lines of each one of those files has a conversation. We'll see over here what type of conversation that is. And then up here, we'll see who added that conversation. So through this, we can see in the file battleship.java on line 136, the user JF, which is me, added a defect, which is still unresolved. Likewise on location.java in that file on line 36, we can see that the user JF has accepted whatever conversation happened on line 36. So again, we can use this to easily digest feedback. Um, this highlighting in yellow over here is just going to tell you which conversations have new messages that you haven't read yet. So let's go back to my, <clears throat> excuse me go back to my review in progress. And that's digesting feedback. Let's look at uploading a new revision. Now from GitHub, that's as easy as updating your pull request. So again, I'd be doing this on my local machine and I would push up my changes to my branch that's involved with my pull request. But from here, I'll just make some kind of changes. And I'll commit this directly to my pull request and that will automatically update Collaborator. Again, we have that webhook in the background. So the webhook is going to reach out to Collaborator and say, hey, we 
have a new update on that file. And we can go back to my review, go to my material section once this loads. And we can see over here that in our status section, this now says one when before it said zero. And we can click into our file and see that we now have our change successfully populated. Now here's where I can play around with some of those buttons and um, see the different changes. I didn't make a change in my first time, but um, here's if we had more commits, you could see those. And now with that, our reviewer can send this back to inspection and we can move back into that fourth phase, which is how do we wrap this up. Now, before I do that, I will just drag over my client GUI and we'll look at how to do this from something outside of GitHub. Just like creating a review, if I wanted to add my changes, I can select my changes that I've made locally. And instead of creating a new review, I'll just add those to my existing review. Let me see my review down there and I would click finish and that would upload those changes. Um, so that's how you would do that if you weren't using something like GitHub. So I'll pause there. Any questions on that part? You actually just answered the question that came in. Someone okay. was wondering what to do when they've um, when they've uploaded, you know, their code for a review. They've got some comments, um, and then they made changes to the code according to those comments. So they were just curious: is there a way to put the new code into that same review, and how? So you pretty much answered the question. So that was good. Cool. Cool. And I will point out, because I've gotten this question a few times in the past week, um, these comments that we make in the diff viewer for the files will persist throughout new commits. So if I'm uploading and adding files to my review, different versions of my file, those comments aren't going to go away. They're going to stay there for every version that I add. But what we'll do is we'll add in the conversation a notifier that someone's uploaded a new version of the file and we'll put that commit ID. So you have that history and you can see the lineage of when comments were added and then which revisions were associated with those comments. All right, so we got to wrap up quick. So I'm just going to quickly hop back into my reviewer and we'll look at that final phase, which is how do I finalize my review, approve my review, fix some of those defects that we found. And that's going to be, um, well, let's look at approving defects first. That's going to be as simple as clicking this mark is fixed button. Um, again, we'll have that visual indicator that our review is fixed or that our defect is marked as fixed or resolved by that red ladybug turning green. And then our reviewer can just go back to our main screen and send the review to complete it. Now, because this particular because this particular template I'm using um, only requires one reviewer, and I only have one reviewer, my review will move to the completed state as soon as that reviewer has approved it. And that's pretty much it. That's the basic process. Um, hopefully, that made sense to everybody. Hopefully, I showed some stuff that people haven't seen before, or that was helpful. Um, do we have any other questions that have come through? So someone wants to know, how can we extract the report? Ah, that's a good one. No, oh, ending on a good question. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> so the, the easiest report to get for a specific review is the details review report. And you can get that just by going to this action items menu up here. Again, this is 11.3. Um, on 11.2, it looks a little bit different, but you want to look for that details button. And when you click that details button, that's going to open up this details report, which is going to show you all the information about the review. Things that we'd expect to see, like who started the review, how many defects were found, how long did it take, down to checklists that were checked, comments that were made, where in the file those comments were made, uh, and then you can export this to PDF. Now you can also set up your server to automatically export this to PDF using triggers, um, something we can talk about at a later time, um, but that's how you can get that detailed report for review. You can also go to the reporting section and access it that way where we also have all the other reports that are available on Collaborator. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our time. As soon as you finish all of your uh, Smart Bear Academy sessions, you actually get a certificate saying that you've completed it. You're basically going to be a Collaborator expert, which is pretty cool. Um, we give you a certificate that you can print out. And yeah, feel free to show it off. Tell your other friends about it, <laughs> whatever it may be. But uh, we will hopefully see you all soon and we'll talk to you later. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.